Welcome back to another episode of Peep and Eat, the one and only EIP dedicated series where we discuss an Ethereum improvement proposal and understand how it is going to make Ethereum even better. My name is Pooja Ranjan and I'm your host for today's episode on EIP 3074 Native Sponsored Transaction. Before we introduce the author, a quick reminder, the Berlin upgrade is announced and we have covered all EIPs which are going on the Robston testnet on March 10th. So if you have missed watching Berlin EIPs, you may follow the recording available on PPNE playlist at Ethereum Catalyst YouTube. EIP 3074 is a standard track code proposal. Uh, it was proposed in October 2020 and currently in draft status. This is also proposed for the next scheduled upgrade that is London. To talk about the proposal, we have Sam Wilson, Ansgar, Matt Garnett, and we are also joined by the cat herders, William Schwab, Alita Moore, and Brent Alsa. For those who aren't aware, Sam, uh, who is um, author of this uh, proposal, has also co-authored EIP 2938 account abstraction and has been on our show a couple of times. Nice to have you again, Sam. For our audiences, may you have a quick intro and then we will proceed with the presentation. Sure, and uh, you know I'm happy to be here. Thanks for having me back. There we go. All right, so I'm here. I'm Sam Wilson. I'm here to talk about native sponsored transactions. Um, I'm a developer for Quilt at uh, Consensus AG. You can find my Twitter and GitHub links in the presentation slides. Um, EIP 3074 is heavily based on the work done by any.sender. Um, and there have been quite a few people who have been critical in getting EIP 3074 uh, as far as it is, has gotten. Um, if I've forgotten you, I'm sorry, it's absolutely not intentional. Um, I want to dive right in and talk a little bit about what are sponsored transactions before going into the specification itself. So uh, at, at the core, a sponsored transaction is a transaction where the account paying for gas is not the account performing the action. Um, it's much easier to explain this with use cases, though, so I'm going to jump into those. Uh, the first use case I'd like to consider is paying for gas with tokens. Uh, so let's say you have some wrapped ETH or some DAI and you want to send a transaction. Well, you can't because only a native unwrapped ether can be used to pay for gas. So with sponsored transactions, you can use uh, you know, non-ether assets to pay for gas. Um, another really popular use case, um, this is like Infura transactions or any.sender is automated gas pricing. So you set a deadline that you want your transaction to be included on chain by, and the sponsor takes care of resending the transaction with different gas prices to get the perfect gas price to get your transaction on chain. Um, the third use case is uh, subsidized apps. So this is like, let's say you have a game or a new, a, a new application, and you want to pay for some or all of your users' transactions. Um, that's a great use case for sponsored transactions. And finally, um, definitely not the last use case, but the last one I'm going to mention is off-chain fee payments. If you want to pay for your crypto kitties with a credit card, or you want to, for some reason, use Bitcoin to pay for your Ethereum transactions, you can use sponsored transactions to do that. Uh, so sponsored transactions are something that sort of exists on mainnet today. Um, but they're emulated, and I'll get into what that means a little bit later. Um, but like I mentioned before, Infura Transactions, Any.Sender, and Open Gas Station Network are existing platforms that provide sponsored transactions today. Um, the downside to these, these current implementations is that you can't actually set message.sender um, natively. You, you can't fake it. It always ends up being the sponsor's account uh, or, or some contract downstream from the sponsor. Um, so every contract that wants to support meta transactions or sponsored transactions needs to implement support for it. So there are a bunch of different EIPs. Three that I mentioned here are um, 2612, which adds a permit function uh, based on an ECDSA signature. Um, and that's for ERC-20s. Uh, EIP 3009 lets you do a transfer with a, a ERC-721 signature. And EIP 2771, has this idea of like a trusted forwarder contract that fakes message.sender, but again, it requires support in the, the, the downstream construct, contracts. Um, and unfortunately, many contracts just don't have support for this. Uh, so let's talk about EIP 3074 a little bit. Um, so let's say we create an EVM instruction uh, named call from, and we're gonna make it work as closely as we can to the existing call instruction 
with one important difference that uh, it recovers an address from an ECDSA signature and it sets message.sender to that address. Um, and that's pretty much it. Thanks for coming to my EIP. Um, does anybody have any questions? Then fortunately, it's not really that simple, but I do like making really bad jokes. Um, the details are a little bit messier, uh, but it's not too bad. So first I wanna go into a few definitions. Um, there are four key kind of terms that I wanna get right. Um, there are a lot of actors and participants in sponsored transactions and everybody has different names for them. So these are the terms that I'm using for this EIP and this, this peep and eep session. Um, if you don't like them, leave a comment, I won't read it. Um, first, we have the externally owned accounts. We have the sponsor and the sponsee. Uh, the sponsor pays for the gas and submits the transaction, where the sponsee is the person who actually wants to do the interaction on chain. So um, if, if uh, in ITX and pure transactions or any dot sender would be the sponsor, the sponsee would be me or the person using that service. Um, and then we have two uh, contracts that exist, or, or two contracts that are important, rather. We have the invoker contract, which is the contract that actually uses the call from instruction. And we have the callee contract, which is ultimately who the sponsee wants to talk to or the contract that the sponsee wants to use. Um, so now I'm going to flip off to the EIP, um, and we'll go through a little bit more of the formal specifications, and then I'll flip back and forth a few times. So. Um, here is the actual specification. Uh, there's an, we're going to create an opcode at F9, um, and it will function exactly like a call instruction. You know, it'll have a two address, it'll have a value. Um, important thing to note about value is that in 3074, you can't transfer value from the sponsee. All of the value has to come from the invoker contract. And that's because of, there's some complicated mempool rules, but that's a little out of scope for uh, the, the summary that I'm giving here. Um, you pass gas, ex gas for execution, um, you pass call data, and you pass return to, uh, an area for return data. So that, that's exactly like the, uh, the way a call function works. The, um, the, the only interesting part here is that you set the caller address, the message.sender, based on an ECDSA signature. Um, there are some technical details here that are, are specified. So um, call from increases the call depth by one um, in exactly the same way as call. Um, it doesn't increase it by two. So it, like if you imagined it as call from first calling into the spawn C and then into the callee, that's not what happens. It increases, it calls directly into the callee and increases the call depth by one. Um, and then we specify one other technical detail here, which is that in a static context, so if you're familiar with like libraries and, or sorry, with a view and peer functions in Solidity, um, they use the static context. Um, so if you send any value with call from, it won't work in a static context. And that's kind of intuitive because if you send value, you change state and you're not allowed changing state in a static context. And that's exactly the same way as call. So we already went over our definitions and I'm sure you don't care about conventions. So let's jump right into uh, constants. So there's only one real constant in the EIP, which is sponsor type. So we reserve an EIP 2711 or 2718, sorry, transaction type um, for signature collision resistance. So if we didn't do this, some malicious party could craft a special signature package for you that you sign that then behaves like some other Ethereum primitive. So by prefixing the signature package with a special value, we can reduce the chance of collisions. It's not perfect, but it does reduce the chance of collisions. Um, now I want to talk a little bit about the actual arguments and how call from looks. So this part here is still a little bit in flux. This is one of the um, not fully finished parts and there's still some discussion going on. Um, but as specified here, I think it would work. So if we want to stop today and go with this, it's totally possible. Um, so the first three arguments on the stack here, Y parity R and S are the signature provided by the sponsee. Uh, then we provide the sponsee itself. Uh, and this is a gas optimization. So uh, the call from opcode or instruction does an EC recover internally. Um, and the reason why we provide spawn C here is so that the invoker doesn't also have to, to, to do a second EC recover. 
then we have Depth Left. So Depth Left is a new addition to the EIP, and I'm not sure if a lot of people have seen it yet, um, but it's here because of some interesting properties of the EVM. So uh, Depth Left. Uh, if you're not aware, the EVM limits the number of nested calls in the EVM to uh, about 1,024, if I'm not mistaken. Every time you do a call, a static call, or any other kind of call, the remaining depth is reduced by one. And when you run out of depth, uh, you can't make any more calls. Um, and this is only for nested calls. It's not for sequential calls. So uh, call from has this special depth left argument to ensure that the callee will have access to a certain number of uh, call slots, or, or call, call stack slots, rather. Uh, and without specifying depth left, a malicious sponsor could call into a bunch of different contracts and waste the, the call depth um, so that by the time the callee gets invoked, it doesn't have any depth left, and then it'll fail. So that would mean a malicious sponsor could grief uh, a sponsee. So like I said, this is a recent addition to the EIP and, and it hasn't been discussed much, but I think it's an important thing to add. Um, and the big takeaway from depth left is that writing uh, ungriefable sponsored transactions or at least minimally griefable sponsored transactions is really difficult. Um, and there are a lot of edge cases. So I'm gonna flip back to the EIP here and we can keep talking. So we have this extra parameter next. So extra is kind of the whole magic of this EIP. Everything that the invoker wants to check, so replay protection uh, and other security concerns, which we'll get into later, all of that gets packed into the extra field and then signed over. And then we're back to the regular uh, call in, uh, arguments. So we have gas, the gas provided, callee or two, the person getting called or the contract getting called, uh, value, which is the amount of uh, way or ether to transfer from the invoker to the callee contract, call data, and a space for return value. So this is the rest of the arguments are exactly like a regular call instruction. Um, now, I, I should take some time to talk about what the signature is signing over. So Y parity R and S are computed from uh, the SEC P 256K1 of the Catch Act 256 of this thing. This thing here is what I've been calling the transaction-like package. Um, so first we have this signature uh, or collision. We have a byte for collision resistance, like I mentioned earlier. Then we have the invoker address, the chain ID, and extra. So chain ID is still being discussed. We may or may not include it, but the idea remains the same. You sign over this extra field and the address of the invoker. So in other words, what you're doing as the sponsee is you're committing to give a particular invoker control over your EOA. And that's what the signature does. Um, so I've explained all of those. Um, so let's talk a little bit about what comes out of call from. So this is a bit different than a normal call. Instead of pushing one, off, uh, one stack element, it pushes two. So the first stack element input, or <laughs> stacks are weird. So the top of the stack, uh, after call from returns is the valid byte. Uh, it is a true or false that determines whether or not the signature and transaction like package was valid. And I'll talk about what that means in a second. Uh, but, but valid is false if you have an invalid signature. The uh, recovered address doesn't mass match the passed in sponsee. Um, if there's insufficient balance in the invoker to make the call, or if there's insufficient call depth available to make that many nested calls. Uh, and then, then we have the success byte, which is a Boolean um, that is zero or false if it's invalid. So if, if th these checks fail, success also fails. Um, or if the uh, callee contract reverts, halts, runs out of gas, or if the call de depth limit has been reached. Otherwise it's true. So if you want to think about this in a different way, um, valid is kind of like the, uh, things that are faults that are attributable to the sponsor. So the environment is set up incorrectly. And then success are faults that are attributable to the callee. So let's flip over back to the slides and I'll tell you a little bit more. Ah, well, I missed a slide. Sorry about that. Missed a bunch of slides. We're gonna go here and then we're gonna go back. So uh, we have these two things. We have this valid uh, output and we have a success output. So, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, if the recovered address doesn't ma match spawn C, there's not enough gas, or the call deep is uh, or call stack is too full of stuff, 
um, that's the sponsor's fault. So the sponsor would not be reimbursed for um, any of these checks failing. So these things can all be checked off chain. Um, you can pretty much guarantee that once you have checked them, they won't change, or at least uh, they, they won't change unless you make them change. Um, so as long as the sponsor doesn't screw up, this will stay true. And then we have this the uh, success Boolean, which is more like the Boolean returned by the call upcode. So if the callie reverts, the callie runs out of gas, or the callie calls more than depth left uh, subcalls, the sponsor is reimbursed because the sponsor didn't make a mistake here. Um, so as, as success will be false in the case of like, uh, you're doing a Uniswap and there's too much slippage, um, the sponsor still needs to get paid. Uh, so let's flip back. Uh, so I cover this. So the invoker. So <clears throat> what is the invoker? This is definitely an important discussion to have and uh, sorry for delaying it. But the invoker is a contract that's on chain that must be trusted. It is basically enabled. It's a contract that can do whatever it wants once it has a signature for your account. So the invoker needs to be audited, formally proven, like it needs to be incredibly secure and it needs to enforce the rules. Um, so it'll need to do replay protection. There's no replay protection in the signature itself. So you have to use the extra field to implement it. Same thing for the gas, depth left, the value, even who you're calling and the call data passed to callee. All of that needs to be enforced by the invoker itself. Kind of a cool side effect of this though, is that the invoker gets to define all of these things. So if you want to make a batched uh, transaction system where you can have multiple uh, subcalls valid with a single signature, you can have an invoker that enables that. If you want to have fancy nonce schemes, multi nonces or random nonces or, or anything that's not just a simple uh, increment a number and that's it, you can implement that in the invoker. But a poorly written or malicious invoker can do almost anything with an EOA. So users have to trust these things and they have to be incredibly scrutinized. Okay. So let's finish up the, um, the EIP itself. So the gas fees are a little bit different than other opcodes. They're somewhat dynamic. Uh, so if the preconditions fail, the fee will be 3,200 gas. If the preconditions pass, the fee will be 3,200 gas plus the cost of a normal call. Um, excuse me. So uh, some rationale here. So we leave out the chain ID and invoker address in the arguments because you can calculate them inside the opcode. Um, why do we have two return values? So a really common question that came up in the development of this EIP is why do I return valid and success and not just smush them together into one return value like call? And uh, the reason is an invoker needs to be able to tell the difference between a sponsor attributable fault and a sponsee attributable fault. Uh, if a sponsor does something bad, they don't get reimbursed. If a sponsee does something bad, the sponsor still needs to get paid. And that's why there's two bulls. There are other ways you can encode it. You can use a, a, a special revert reason. Uh, you can use different numbers in the same stack element. Um, and if you want more information about why I don't think those are a good idea, the EIP has that. Uh, but basically, you need to be able to differentiate between uh, sponsee and sponsor attributable faults. So going into why sponsee, I think I covered that already earlier, uh, and why I reserve a 2718 transaction type collision resistance. Ah, here's a here's a big one. So why are we? Why did I propose another sponsor transaction EIP? There's a 2711 that already exists. Uh, Matt has one, which is uh, transaction packages, which. I don't remember the EIP number four, and I'm sorry. So why this particular approach? Um, so originally, I uh, found any dot senders approach, which is very similar to this, uh, because of account abstraction, which is another EIP I worked on earlier in this year and last year. Um, other approaches to sponsored transactions introduce a new transaction type, real transaction type, so that it would only be signable or, or creatable by an EOA. Account abstraction contracts are not EOAs, so they cannot sign typed transactions. Uh, EIP 3074 
is a much simpler, much more focused. It does one thing EIP and it's compatible with account abstraction. And that's why I think this is the right EIP to go with for sponsored transactions. Um, another kind of quick explanation I want to give is, is why are we only signing over uh, invoker and extra? And why do we give so much power to the invoker? Um, so earlier versions of this EIP implemented replay protection and had all this uh, other junk in it. And really what it comes down to is if you have to trust the invoker for replay protection, why not trust the invoker for everything? And that kind of came into this really elegant system where all you sign is this hash and then you trust the invoker to do the right thing with that hash. And that gives you all the security you need as long as your invoker is secure. Um, and finally, I just wanna talk about security considerations because there are a lot of things you need to pay attention to with this EIP. Um, the big one, at least in my opinion, is that um, if a contract requires that message.sender equals tx.origin, um, and I, I don't know of many contracts that do this, and I don't think it's ever been recommended as a good thing to do, but I'm sure some people do it. <laughs> it's, it's Ethereum, everybody does whatever they want. Um, so this no longer prevents reentrancy, um, which means, so if, if I sponsor myself, I can create a uh, sponsored transaction where message.sender equals tx.origin, even though I'm not in the top of the call stack. And this might break some contracts. Um, the, uh, the, the, the next security consideration is if you have a bug and signature verification, you can impersonate EOAs. And that's, that's a big deal. But um, on the other hand, we do a lot of ECDSA signature checks already. So I think the risk of a bug here is, is relatively low. Um, I'm going to skip over this big block and come back to it. So uh, front running is a bit of a concern. So if you have a general purpose invoker, um, sponsors can be front run. So if uh, I'm running a front running bot and I notice that I can extract more value from someone's transaction like package than, than the original sponsor, I can take that package and resend it and I can front run the sponsor. The sponsee's transaction, it, it still goes through, just the sponsor is different. And you can write invokers that you know, deal with this and make it safe, but that that's still there. But the big the big list of security considerations are how to write a safe invoker, and this is going to be difficult. And I don't want to have any part of it. But I want to I want to let smarter people than me write good invokers. So th this is a list of the security considerations that I've thought of or we've thought of. Uh, first of all, replay protection. If your invoker doesn't implement replay protection, your signature can be used over and over and over again to repeat the transaction. That's not good. Uh, next, you can you can adjust value. Uh, so if you're deploying a contract or or buying an NFT or doing anything that requires a specific amount of value to be sent with the transaction, um, a malicious sponsor could adjust that and completely screw up your transaction. Um, next, a, a malicious sponsor could adjust the amount of gas sent with your transaction. Um, if you don't sign over gas or include gas in extra, which is then signed, um, a malicious sponsor could cause your, tra your transaction to fail, costing you money, even though you specified it correctly. Similar thing with depth left. If, if you manipulate the stack to cause your transaction to fail, the sponsor could e extract fees without actually committing your transaction. Uh, and finally, callee and call data should be included in extra because without them, a uh, malicious sponsor can just call anybody and do anything. So obviously those things need to be protected. Um, <clears throat> yeah, let's go back here. So I just wanna talk quickly about the status of EIP 3074. Uh, 3074 is almost ready to go to the review state. I don't think there's any large outstanding changes. Uh, you know, cross my fingers. Um, and it'll definitely be ready for the next Allcore devs call on March 19th. Um, now I'm actually done. And if anybody have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Thank you for the wonderful presentation, Sam. Um, and uh, I would like to congratulate on the latest version that I believe was pushed uh, yesterday, uh, where most of the questions like the concerns have been uh, addressed. So, uh, uh, I'm curious to understand the importance of chain ID. Like there has been some discussion on this field, particular field to be added and to be removed. So my question is why, why, or why not do you think chain ID field is so significant for this proposal? Sure. Like 
So uh, specifically, the chain ID is included in the uh, sign the the data you sign over. Um, and why I think it's important is because I don't think it's going to be very likely for an invoker not to check chain ID. Uh, and I think we should optimize at least a little bit for the common case. Um, but that said, it's possible to implement without including chain ID. So the, the invoker can check chain ID and make sure that it, it matches correctly. So I, I'm leaning towards removing it from the EIP at this time. Okay, that makes sense. I, I had a question, that's all right, Pooja. Go ahead, James. The also, uh, it's it's awesome to see double thumbs up if I had my camera on on getting to the review state and like actually using those statuses. Thank you. Um, the I'm, I'm imagining so this EIP gets done. Is it do would we need to have the work done on invokers before this becomes useful or used? So no, um, I think it's pretty trivial to write a an invoker for a trusted sponsor. So if you have, you know, in Fira transactions or any dot sender, um, they could write a very simple single sponsor uh, invoker that would only work with their their tools. And that would be easy enough and, and quick enough to get started. And then the, the general one you're saying would be a lot harder to write. Exactly, That's probably yeah. like an ERC or something like that. You imagine written after the yeah, fact. Exactly. So, so Ansgar and uh, I think it was Patrick have actually put together some uh, sample invoker contracts that kind of show what it would look like. Um, but they don't deal with all of the general problems and edge cases that you would get in a uh, multi-sponsor invoker. Wow, that's awesome. This is something that's come up a lot on different core dev calls on the last, the last couple of years of like how to make this possible because it's been something a lot of people have wished. So it's, it's cool to see these working out. Yeah, I'm really happy about it. I, I yeah. So one of the comment that I found on the magician thread was about uh, the EIP 712, like the relationship of this EIP with that. It states that it's uh, incompatible with EIP 712 and mapping selected could be used to confuse existing wallets into signing an unintended message. What yeah. are your thoughts uh, like on this comment? Like, would it, uh, would it actually uh, create confusion to existing users of EIP 712? Um, so I don't think it would create confusion with users of EIP 712. Like, I think this is going to require some small amount of wallet work anyways. Um, so I, I'll talk about that in two parts. The first part is going to be why I didn't use EIP 712. Uh, 712 and the second part is signature collisions. So uh, the first part is why I didn't use EIP 712. 712 is still draft. Uh, it's gone through at least three revisions that have been implemented in wallets. If you try to sign an EIP 712 transaction uh, or, or, or package, it's, it's difficult. Um, and in this case, I don't think it adds too much benefit. So um, one of the things EIP 712 tries to do is kind of segregate signatures into particular domains based on the contract, the... Um, uh, signature of the method being called. So a lot of those things don't even apply here. There's no signature of a method being called. It's always just these three values. Um, and EIP 712 adds an extra uh, Catch Act 256 call, which would add extra gas usage. So that's those are the two reasons why I don't use it. It's just not final. And I don't think it adds a lot. Um, and the second part is signature collisions. And that's definitely a real concern. Um, that's Part of the reason why, like, if you've ever tried to sign a message in a wallet, it adds the special magic bytes at the beginning, like zero Ethereum signed message. Um, so there's a whole lot of problems with signature collisions. Uh, this particular scheme uh, can't ever conflict with a, a normal uh, legacy transaction, like a non-type transaction, because type transactions always begin with a value over C7 or something like that. Um, I, I don't know the exact number. And this transaction begins with, or this package begins with uh, 0, 03. So it can't conflict with legacy transactions. And uh, further, it can't conflict with typed transactions because we're actually reserving a type transaction value for this package. Um, and th that, that reduces the chances of signature collisions. That's not to say they're impossible. 
it's just fairly unlikely. Uh, thank you. I mean, you have partially answered my follow-up question. It was about the type transaction. So uh, I was wondering, like this type transaction, is it because this proposal is expected after Berlin upgrade in which the EIP 2718 is already getting included or uh, like we see an additional advantage of that? Yeah, so definitely after 2718, um, although not required, right? It, it, this doesn't actually use any of the machinery associated with 2718. It just reserves the 2718 type for collision resistance. Okay, we have got one question in chat. Uh, it is by like client. What does the threat model look like for improperly implemented invokers versus <laughs> general smart contract uses? Sure. So an improperly implemented invoker can do almost anything it wants with an EOA. So if you sign a, a transaction like package to a, a poorly implemented invoker, you basically just lost control of your EOA. The invoker can do whatever it wants with your account except send ETH from it. Um, so yeah, don't sign messages to invokers you don't fully trust. Can you expand more on this like concept of trusting invoker? Because I think it's like kind of nuanced, but um, the fact that it's a smart contract, that's a different type of trust than if you were to trust a an sponsor. exchange or a person or a sponsor. Yeah. So trusting the invoker is kind of like saying, I have validated that the invoker enforces the, cons the security uh, properties that I want for this transaction. So if you, Trusting the invoker means you don't need to trust your sponsor. You don't need to trust anybody else in the ecosystem. You can verify this smart contract and you can say, my transaction will be included properly or the sponsor will pay like the fee for the transaction. Um, so some examples of this, like replay protection. So if you have a, an invoker that properly implements replay protection, your signature can't be reused once it's put on chain. But if you have an invoker that doesn't properly implement replay protection, your signature could be reused a whole bunch. So you have to trust that the invoker correctly implements replay protection. And the same is true for all of the other security uh, concerns that I mentioned down here. And it's basically the kind of trust that you put into, let's say, the ETH2 deposit contract, right? Exactly. That's um, a perfect you... example. Yeah, I mean, I think it's, you know, I think it makes a lot of sense because you know, we use things every day that we haven't validated ourselves, but we trust because it's commonly used and experts have reviewed it. I mean, we use these cryptography schemes and, you know, the number of people who have actually gone through it and say, oh yeah, this is easy. The DSA thing actually does work is very small compared to the number of people who use and trust it. So I think like that makes sense. Do you have any ideas on how downstream tooling will help people avoid using bad invokers? Sure. So I think I think that's a pretty easy thing to answer. I think there's going to be a very small number of general purpose invokers, and I think that they are going to be audited and agreed upon by the community the same way that the deposit contract was. Um, and then wallets will warn you with big giant red bold letters uh, and make you type your password if you want to use any invoker that isn't one of those verified invokers. And then for uh, on the other hand, you have these these sponsor specific invokers. So Infura Transactions will write a, a, an invoker, Any.Sender will write an invoker, OpenGSN will write an invoker. And those are going to be specific to their project. And instead of trusting the invoker, you trust the sponsor. So you say, I trust that Infura Transactions will not replay my, my signature. And you know that's a, a different kind of assumption you can make, but it means you have a simpler contract on chain. Um, how is this different from a smart contract? Because, um, you know, like, I mean, right now, if I want to do um, execute some sort of trade um, using a smart contract, I have to trust the smart contract to um, not steal my money. And so, like, how is this particular really different or more risky or less risky? Right. So let's assume that you have, you know, a million dollars in DAI. Um, in your smart contract wallet, and then you approve a $100 die spend to a smart contract, and then you that 100 the, the that smart contract does something with the 100 die. Um, they can only uh, use the 100 die that you approved for them. But if you were to do the same thing with an invoker contract, and you signed it saying that they're allowed using your account, well now 
they can take your, your million die, but also they can take all your crypto kitties. They can take all of your, uh, you know, and fancy NFT artwork. They can take anything that your account has ever interested, like anything owned by your account. It's not limited to just what you've sent to the invoker. They can do anything as if they were you, except take ETH out of your account. And how much work, extra work would it take to say, for example, limit the exposure there by, I don't know, like creating a separate account? Like, is that an option? Because it seems kind of crazy to me that we're basically giving people like um, the ability to, I don't know, like my, my, my recovery phrase for my wallet or whatever, um, if that makes sense. Yeah, I mean, that, that's actually a kind of a decent way to think about it. Signing a transaction to an invoker is like sharing your private key with that invoker. It's not exactly the same, but you should treat it with the same kind of security concerns. Um, but since the invoker is a contract, you can make sure that it doesn't do bad things. But also um, just to maybe put, put that into perspective a little bit, because Sam is like a very security-minded person. And I mean, that's great. And EAP author, author of course, you, you want that. But like... Um, I would say it's it, like the security level is maybe somewhat comparable to say um, maybe like deep. I think DeFi DeFi contracts are a good example because people do put a lot of money into those, right? They, the, the, those are smart contracts, and you don't only trust them with like a hundred die, but you actually like people send millions into those. And similar to how like the level of audit auditing that goes into the latest Aave contract or the latest Uniswap contract, that's the level of auditing we are talking about. You, you, you uh, like for, for invokers. So it's not about like literally this once in a lifetime thing, like the E2 deposit contract, but it's also a lot, right? Just like a lot of people are hesitant to put, put a lot of money into new DeFi contracts until they're like proven and a lot of audits have happened and so on. So I think like as a mental model, basically like thinking of it as the similar security level as like a DeFi project where you would want, uh, would put a, like a significant amount of money into. I think, I think that's actually like a fair comparison. So my primary like, um concern not i mean like the thing that just kind of confuses me a little bit is like um i feel like there's a little bit of a realized risk differential there in the sense that like um i mean couldn't any contract potentially be like an invoker without telling me um and then m more so like you know like if, if i'm sending ten dollars to an invoker um like i don't know i just feel like it's not going to feel very um, scary compared to right. in a million. So I feel so, like a bit of a differential that can happen or bias. So I think the, the thing that tooling can really help here is when like, so you actually have to provide a signature when you are doing anything with an invoker. So you can't hide an invoker, like, like a, you can't hide this opcode in a random contract and it can take control of your account. That contract needs to get a signature from you. So tooling like MetaMask or, or wallets can you know, explicitly list the risks, tell you like what is happening when you sign that particular package. But they don't have to, do they? The the tools? Yeah. I mean, the obviously tools. you should, but like they don't. So none of the tools right now will let you sign one of these packages. They'll, they just won't. Okay. So like the, they'll have to add support to sign these packages. And in adding support for that, they can add the warnings and, and the, the proper messaging. I guess that the thing that I'm trying to say is like, we're basically giving somebody a gun and we're saying, hey, you should, you should really teach people how to, how to use this um, and then just trusting that they will. And um, I'm not like saying that this isn't well thought out or anything. And I don't know enough. I'm just learning about this now. I'm just, I'm just saying um, it's, an, it's a, a little bit scary to think about um, yes. that if it's not implemented properly that I am going to be signing off or if it's implemented maliciously that I could potentially be pressing a button to then sign off my entire account. I think yeah, a so good that's... analogy is smart contract wallets though because the smart contract wallet has a lot of the similar um, you know, threat models that you have with this. You know, you're you're choosing a smart contract wallet that you're going to put all of your funds in. That's like choosing an invoker you're going to use, and you should choose one that you trust and that is is, is uh, you know it's vetted. And if you know something goes wrong, if you sign like one wrong thing, your smart contract wallet, you know, you can lose all the funds out of that. And this opcode is like you know strictly opt in. It's, you're not going to accidentally sign something that goes through that opcode. And the, the main advantage of it is you don't have to actually 
uh, deploy a smart contract wallet to get all of these functionalities that the smart contract wallets have. So I think that's the power. And I kind of just thought about this just now as you guys were talking, um, but I think the smart contract wallet analogy is is a pretty good way to think about it. Yeah, that's pretty decent. So like by signing one of these packages for an invoker, you are saying that invoker is allowed to act as a smart contract wallet for you. Um, and kind of I mean, a less technical analogy is like this EIP is building the firing pin for a gun and absolutely somebody can build a foot gun. They can build something that when you use it will shoot you in the foot. Um, but that doesn't mean you can't build a, a safe gun with it, but it's a building block that can be used either way. I mean, for the same price, the we could talk about the blockchain platform in general. I mean, if our goal is to actually give people sovereignty with value, that means they absolutely have the ability, even with an EOA, like outside of a smart contract wallet, to lose their funds in ways that have not generally been available for them to totally lose their funds with till now. I mean, the, the way that the legacy finance system works, it's more centralized, there's more recovery. I mean, you lose your keys and everything's gone. Just, I mean, in order to give that level of sovereignty, in order to be able to give that level of flexibility, so it's true, there has to be some kind of counterbalance on the other side of the scale for it. But from the flip side, I mean, we see the, the restrictions that happen across the ecosystem because of people not being able to get their gas fees sponsored. So again, it opens up a world of flexibility, but flexibility always comes with more responsibility, so to speak. Okay, this is like a little bit different, but still kind of a similar idea. I was wondering if you can expand on, um, on the you know how this EIP is different than the other native sponsor transaction EIPs, because I think that it's a again a very nuanced difference about how this is an opcode and how the validity is you know determined in the EVM versus determining the validity in the mempool. Sure. So there's. There's a couple like major differences here. So, so one, this doesn't require a new transaction type. So um, that means it's more compatible with AA, like I mentioned earlier, but that's not really a huge selling point. So let's talk about a little bit more about the actual differences between introducing an opcode versus introducing a transaction type. So introducing a transaction type means new mempool rules. New, so like for, for those who aren't aware, the mempool is where uh, transactions go before they're included on chain. And it's a huge avenue and opportunity for denial of service attacks. So rules in the mempool or transaction pool are very strict. So adding new transaction types, types need to be very concerned with, are they a, a denial of service vector? Um, you know, can this hurt nodes? Can this cause additional processing? Uh, and that's one thing the CIP doesn't do any of. It, it doesn't change the mempool rules at all. But on the flip side, it doesn't change the mempool rules at all. So you don't get any uh, additional flexibility there. Um, if like you can't do expiring, so uh, EIP 2711 uh, has more than just sponsored transactions. It also has expiring transactions and batch transactions. So an expiring transaction is a transaction that you submit and past a certain block or a certain date, it is no longer valid to be included on chain. So that's not something you get with this EIP. This EIP um, while you can expire a transaction so that it doesn't run after a certain date, the sponsor would still be charged fees for it. And that, that's kind of less than ideal. Um, but there's no added complexity. The, all of the complexity in this is in the EVM and there's no networking, no mempool, none of those changes. So this is a, a much more contained kind of change. Uh, I hope that kind of answers your question, Matt. Yeah, yeah, it does. And the thing that I think is like interesting about that is that usually we're thinking of these relayers as for you know, commercialized entities. And if they're paying fees for something that ends up not being valid, they have this you know, business incentive to build better systems that avoid that. And I think a good example is like, it's kind of, you can build an evoker that's potentially griefable. If you send your transaction to multiple you know, relayers, um, you know, your transaction might be included in one relayer before it's included in a different relayer. And so if that second relayer where your transaction is no longer valid, still submits it, they're going to pay for your call data, even though they're not going to get the fee for that. And so that just incentivizes them to, you know, pay really close attention to the mempool and what transactions are coming into blocks and, you know, resubmit their, their transaction bundles 
um, you know, after it sees that your transaction is no longer valid to uh, include a different set of transactions. Yeah, so I think, I, it I think what you're saying is a lot of like the, com the, the commercial entities that would be relayers have the resources to do the, that kind of complex analysis. Yeah, it's kind of taking like something that could have been done in the protocol and pushing it to the people who are incentivized to do it in the best way possible. Yeah, I would agree with that. Um, uh, James, do you have any question? Uh, yeah, I just wanted to uh, see if I check understanding on like a possible analogy using the DeFi contract stuff. So like when I'm farming, there's a few trusted contracts. If you're gonna deposit money into a farm to farm X token, if they're using the synthetics contracts, you can look at it and like, if there's been three changes and the token IDs are different, then you know, okay, this is safe. Or like people talk about it's the sushi stuff contract. So yeah, that's been like looked at a lot. So I guess like invokers will probably have that same kind of relationship of, oh, we know this type has been looked at a ton and it's pretty easy to see if it, if it was changed enough or tools could see that kind of stuff. Oh yeah, yeah. So so if you're deploying, like Open Zeppelin, for example, could have an invoker template that people could implement, and then you would just check to see if it matches the template, and if it does, you're good to use that invoker. Yeah. Cool. I have one last question on the use cases. I believe you briefly mentioned about paying for gas with tokens. So if you could a little bit elaborate on how people can make it useful and like not using it. Sure. So um, the the kind of simplest way that this would work is uh, a sponsor would uh, announce, you know, like or advertise or have a website or an app or whatever that says, you know, uh, I will uh, take die and I will pay for your transactions. So you would sign. Uh, I believe in the current kind of sketch we have that you would sign two. Uh, I guess you actually in the the newest version of the IP you would only sign one package and then your invoker would do. Um, would first transfer DAI to the uh, sponsor's account. And then as the second step in, in a second um, call from instruction would perform your, um, your transaction. So in effect, you're exchanging DAI for uh, gas. That's going to be one of the most usable application because many times people are using ERCs and they do not have actually ether in their wallet to make the transactions in. Yeah, exactly. Um, I think we have a little over time, <laughs> but if people have any final question. I have a, a one I hope is kind of small. Okay. The when you were, th you mentioned that it works with AA, when you were thinking about the EIP, was that like a design thing you went for or is that just something that kind of happened? It's so when we were working on AA, we know, well, I noticed that the leading um, EIP for sponsored transactions was not compatible with AA. And that's actually <laughs> what got me to start working on, on this EIP. <laughs> cool. It's a, you would say it's more like an inspiration that, that started it, right? Because Yeah, and like obviously yeah. it's been a goal to keep it in mind, but it hasn't been the driving force behind the specification. So uh, like this is my final, final question. <laughs> it's about the EIP status. As you already mentioned that uh, it is almost the review ready. Yeah. I think that that's a very good point for this proposal to be, you know, getting proposed for any further upgrade because we are trying to uh, like encourage authors to propose only if their proposal is ready for review. <laughs> so thank you very much for that. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's been a flurry of editing lately. It's it's I feel like it's almost there. So hopefully we can get it in. Yeah. It was really great talking to you, Sam. I really appreciate you taking out time and providing an overview of this proposal. Uh, I think this was interesting considering this was the first time this proposal was ever discussed. I was expecting it earlier to, you know, uh, in the all code meeting, but unfortunately we did not get time. But I think this, this episode is going to be helpful for many people because uh, this gives us enough time to go in like in depth. Um, in less than six months, uh, this proposal has attracted client developers, infrastructure providers, and researchers, maybe because of the 
explosions of tokens that are being built on Ethereum, uh, especially the stable coins. So um, as explained in the motivation section also, uh, it, it has become um, more common for EUAs to hold valuable assets without holding an ether at all. This EIP that specifies a method of implementation of a sponsored transaction that allows both the EOA, I mean, externally owned account and the 2938, as you mentioned, the account abstraction contract as per sponsor. So I'm really looking forward to see implementation in different clients uh, if and when approved by the client staff. Hopefully, as you mentioned in the next all core meeting, best wishes for that. Thank you. On this note, uh, for all our YouTube viewers, if you have any question that couldn't be answered today, you, you may leave your comment to ask the authors. His Twitter handle and GitHub handle is provided in the description as well as the presentation that was shared. Next week, we are going to talk about uh, EIP 1474, that is remote procedure call specification with Eric Marks and Morris. So stay tuned. Your feedback is important to us. Do let us know which EIP would you like to see in future episode. Join ECH Discord. Invite link is provided in the description. For our new viewers, uh, subscribe to Ethereum Cat Herders YouTube channel. Hit the bell icon for updates. Don't forget to like and share with people of similar interest. Keep watching and keep sharing your love with Ethereum Cat Herders. This is all of us signing out.